So today we have Gregory Crane, also known as Greg Crane. He lives in Nashville, correct? Knoxville. Knoxville. The little cousin. The little cousin. The little cousin. And he has been rocking and rolling with his real estate journey. He's got all sorts of things going on today. So we're going to figure out what he's doing now, how he got here, and where he's going to go. So, Greg, you want to give a little bit of uh, introduction about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So, um, as you said, I'm in Knoxville. I'm originally from California. Moved out here in 2020 during the great COVID reshuffle and um, been working remotely uh, in a tech job um, since COVID started. Um, and so I'm still uh, I'm still keeping that, that rolling while I pursue my real estate ventures. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm attacking a lot of different uh, strategies uh, as we talked about before uh, in the real estate world and um, having a good time and meeting a lot of great people. Awesome. It's uh, always fun to hear what people did during COVID. So you you packed up your life and moved from California to Tennessee. Yeah, it was like sourdough bread, uh, kombucha, <laughs> and and, uh, and lots of lots of hikes. And then uh, hey, let's let's move to Tennessee. Uh, but it's pretty here. Um, like I said, it's the the little cousin to to Nashville. It's growing a lot. Um, obviously we have the university here and the Smoky Mountains and, um, uh, it's cool. It's, um, it's a beautiful place. I've got flowers on the red buds right outside my window. So it nice. certainly is, um, working in a, in a corporate white box. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I, it's, it must feel good to have a window to look out every day. Yeah. Well, I worked, um, you know, I worked on confidential launch projects for, 12 uh I, out until last february i was working on um you know product releases um for apple and so uh we couldn't have windows because we were working on you know the new wallpaper for the new iphone things like that so um it was exciting but definitely a, a bit cloistered so I can't only imagine like i just see the phone the i or the box the iphone comes in and then I just imagine you guys working inside that box that the iPhone comes in. Like it must feel the same way. Yeah, pretty much. You know, lots of <laughs> uh, like I said, can't really tell you what I'm working on. Uh, people, uh, well, on my new iPhone. I'm like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do stuff, <laughs> but it was cool. Uh, yeah. That's great. That's great. So I like to structure these where we kind of jump in like a movie or a book and i don't know maybe you should tell people a little bit about what you do for fun first oh yeah so i'm a i originally went to school for theater so um i have for the last eight years or so been keeping that um you know personal addiction fetish whatever you want to call it alive and uh currently um producing and starring in a play with my wife that we're about to take back to the bay area for a uh a reunion tour so to speak so um serves me pretty well in uh jumping from one career to the next the ability to improv and um you know collaborate with people and everything so and it's not just any production can you tell us why this production is so special? Um, well, it's it's just me and my wife, which is, is special on its own. Uh, it's a two-person play about two people falling in love. Um, and it's, you know, very intimate and begins with them consummating their their new relationship. And so um that was uh that was very intense to do in a very intimate setting in Knoxville. And um yeah. All right, fair enough. And it's not in a big theater, right? It's it's just like you guys are in a room with a bunch of chairs. Yeah, the the Knoxville production was in a um in a loft that we took over and turned into a mini theater for a week. Um, the the performance that we're doing back in the Bay Area is at our our old uh, theater that we used to work at a long time. So this will be a little bit more conventional with a proscenium and the audience and seats and a little bit more 
a little bit more distance. So that'll be fun. <laughs> amazing, amazing, cool. So I like to structure these podcasts like a movie or a book. So we're not gonna, we're just gonna jump into like a crazy scene that is happening in your life now or it happened in your life. And I, whatever that is for you, you know, that is the really just gonna capture the audience and capture my attention, right? I'm always curious to see how this goes. So bring us to that scene in your real estate career or your life that brought you to real estate or take, yeah. take you on the journey. Well, that's that's great. That's a, a good lead in. So this is actually, you know, my my second foray into real estate. I um, uh, I had my first child around 28, 29. Um, and like I said, I went to school for theater. That didn't, you know, pan out as most theater careers uh, do. You know, when you realize, oh, wow, I'm going to have a family. I have to figure out how to provide for people. Um, and so I was sort of transitioning, not knowing what I was going to do, but I had um, inherited some money because unfortunately I had, um, you know, uh, I'd lost my mother. Um, and I decided the real estate was going to be the thing for me and, and went to a bunch of seminars and just decided I was going to flip some houses, but really jumped into some things without knowing what I was doing. Uh, ended up in a lot of uh, hot water, thankfully nothing legally, but definitely had some losses. And so quickly put that away. And then this, this whole, you know, sub career of um, uh, working in marketing and tech, thankfully uh, uh, surfaced. And so cut to, <laughs> cut to uh, COVID and uh, the transition to Knoxville. Um, and uh, last year uh, I basically, I won't say I lost my job, but I was forced out of my, um, over 10 year um, Apple uh, career uh, because I could not come back into the office at Apple. Um, and that was um, something that I knew was a risk moving away from the Bay Area, but um, you know, I, I, I was accepting it, but I didn't know what I was gonna do to kind of support my family. And uh, thankfully I was able to stay there, but in a, in a contractor role. Um, but you know, I had uh, basically four years of um, Apple stock sort of obliterated when that happened, right? So future oh, stock that was kind of, you know, my uh -oh. my cushion. All the stuff that I invested up until then, thankfully, was, you know, that that was mine. But so that was really the, the trigger for me that said I need to not be uh, a passive, <laughs> a passive investor in my own life. I need to not expect that some nine to five is going to take care of me through retirement and send my kids to college and all these things, you know, the hopes and dreams that I want to do. Um, and so I said, you know, I have to get a side hustle. I have to figure out how I can generate more income for my family versus just whatever this nine to five life is that I've carved out for myself that I'm not even really passionate about. You know, my passions are making art, doing theater, <laughs> traveling, um, paddle boarding, you know, uh, being with my kids, I want to, you know, have adventures with them and my wife. Um, and so quickly, you know, real estate sort of resurfaced in the back of my mind. Um, and I began my educational journey uh, into trying to figure out what, how I could, you know, kind of take maybe some of the retirement savings that I had, and I knew about self-directed accounts. And so that, that is kind of uh, where the, the, the bug, I got bit by the bug, uh, and it has since morphed into a full on uh, fever of, um, <laughs> of, you know, hopes and dreams in terms of being an investor and growing an empire outside of uh, corporate life. Awesome, that that was really fun. That, I really enjoyed that that progression in that journey. So oh. you, you got started in real estate back when you were early 30s somewhere in that region and you you learned some lessons you know we don't have to get into the specifics of what happened but what lessons did you take away from that your your first foray into real estate yeah um well it's funny because i learned those lessons and then repeated some of them uh just last year <laughs> uh look before you leap uh, learn before you leap. Um, and I would say, you know, talk to people and get some advice from 
more more learned pros um, before just kind of making up a strategy and, and putting your money at risk. Um, and like I said, you know, join this community that we're both in last year, got really excited about it, learned a bunch of stuff, and then, you know, promptly lent some money on some skills that I, that I probably shouldn't have. Um, but, uh, you know, I've survived those bumps and bruises and I still just keep pushing forward. Got it. So it seems like there's a cautionary tale in here mm. uh, for you, for you, and maybe for others out there listening. Can you give them a cautionary tale so that maybe they hear this and they don't do the same thing you did twice? Yeah, I think that um, you know we're a lot of us are all connected through these Facebook groups and these communities, and there's a lot of tales of success and kind of immediate success. Um, we also pony up quite a bit of money to be in these communities and, and get this education. And I, I think for myself, uh, and I know for a lot of people, there's that desire of, well, I put in this money, I have to do something to earn back this money, you know, right away so that I can feel good about laying that out there. Um, and I think that the social media groups create a bit of uh, hysteria and hype and FOMO fear of missing out or um, doing deals. Um, and even people like the coaches that lead these things create FOMO because they are telling us always about all their success. Um, and I'm not saying that they're not, they don't have a lot of great information to share, but they actually went on a long path of discovery and trial and error and failure before they were able to do things so um, efficiently. And what I found in my, um, you know, early missteps, and I'm trying to tamp things down a little bit, is that, um, you know, that that FOMO leads people into just signing up for things that they haven't fully vetted, they haven't underwritten, um, and, you know, maybe aren't the most advisable. Got it. Okay. And I'm glad you brought this up because I think it's one of the most important lessons in general, especially that I learned as well. And, you know, something that you said, uh, the whole the whole thing that you just said really brought me back to when I first joined Sub2, I kind of had the same mindset of like, hey, I want to recoup the money, right? I want to I make money because I see it, I see it, I see it, and I feel like I'm missing out. I FOMO. So I made a couple of YouTube videos when I first joined six months and a year into it. And just like six months ago or something, someone took my video off YouTube and they reviewed sub two, Pace Morby sub two based off of my review and Kevin Cho's review, right? And they took that and it was, I was very honest in it and I was like, you know, it's been six months, I've only made like a $1,000 or whatever it was, or I wasn't making any money. And they took that and they were like, that's the worst group to join because you aren't making any money, you're guaranteed to make money in my group. And that, that kind of upset me, right? Because yeah. I was being honest about a journey and I didn't label it good or bad. They labeled it bad and that, that hurt me. Right? Because yeah. I was, I wasn't saying I was upset. I was saying this is what it is because the internet does create FOMO, and the internet only shows the good things. Very, every so often you get the bad things that come out, and that's one of the reasons I really want to talk about that. Is like, yeah. what are the the maybe not negative aspects of joining a group like Sub Two, but how do we need to reframe our expectations when we join some sort of mentorship or just in general in life because expectations are a killer and they cause us to do things that maybe we want to normally do yeah and they um you know i found as i sort of scroll the the mindless scrolling that i feel my serotonin levels and my my motivation levels and all this kind of going up and down right and it's it's all sort of 
personal judgments of myself and and where I'm at and what I've done and you know why aren't I doing as much as as that person is and then that causes me to go and spend another hour scrolling looking for opportunities or whatever so I'm constantly in a battle with my own um like hormone levels in relation to to social media and it's really it's really bad and it, and it, it makes me kind of you know like i said before kind of um approaching all these different strategies and joining different groups and trying to keep networking because i i want to keep those that my motivation level up and my own sense of uh, accomplishment up and i have this uh great life coach who's amazingly been coaching me for free um we connected through gator uh he's in i have a private mastermind that i uh created of wonderful gators and pmls and connectors and um we share a lot of encouragement and things to watch out for and questions and it's just like a really wonderful group of folks um and so he's been in there and and i was at a real low uh in the fall because i had gotten into all these pml deals and a bunch of them were going south and i kind of put too much money into um lending opportunities and was just kind of totally freaked out and he and i said look whatever your coaching is like i i just need to it's like i knew i needed therapy but i also needed like um like motivation and and but you know he's always kind of bringing me back to look at you know how far you've come like i started gator i think maybe exactly a year ago from today or a couple of days um nice. and it is remarkable when i when i look at how many friends and collaborators and partners i've had and having those i'm really grateful for all the negative experiences and the loss and you know i've already made my way through two foreclosures um and um you know not me defaulting on someone but someone defaulting on debt that i held um and figuring out how to deal with it and you know i've taken a loss on investments but i've also made money on investments um so just constantly being reminded of this is a long slow journey versus i need to become financially free as soon as possible um and i do have my own trajectory goals and i think that i'm you know certainly on on track for those i mean i talked before about um seeing that getting that email from e-trade that says you know your stocks your future stocks have been canceled and like that was really the moment for me that was like this is real but i immediately took it as like okay this is the challenge and the challenge was those were a four-year vesting period of stock i am going to make that amount of money that those are worth in four years in investing and it's i've probably made that money in one year amazing you know I and, and now i still have deals that are uh pending and so i'm i don't want to put the cart before the horse uh i have lost money on a few deals but i also feel i know that i'm going to make more than that because of all these people and partnerships that i've i've fostered so i do think that even if i haven't made money doing creative deals in sub two i've certainly made money being a private lender but more than anything i've i've developed friendships and partnerships with people i know i will do business with um soon or in in the coming years whether that's buying property or um lending money or being a consultant or being a connector i mean there's just so many ways to to skin it that's cool so you got into gator <clears throat> a year ago happy gator birthday i don't know if that's a thing but anniversary yeah, Gatorversary. Happy Gatorversary. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. And because I just I get restless. So excuse me. Okay. Keep going. See yeah. So what were your expectations coming into Gator? Well, that's a good question. So when I first decided I was gonna um, you know, get into investing investing, for some reason I came quickly to notes and note buying and selling. I don't, you know, I was listening to podcasts and everything and it seemed like passive and I knew that I could self-direct my IRA account. And I was like, oh, I'll just buy some notes and that'll be a nice passive thing. Um, and then that sort of quickly led to, oh, you can be a private money lender. Um, 
And then I met with a local private lender and he's like, you know, if you don't have a bunch of money to do, um, uh, you know, these full on first position loans, you can do a Gator loan. And, and I was like, well, what is a Gator loan? And, um, and then, so, you know, went down the YouTube rabbit hole and everything. Um, so what was your original question? What were your expectations coming into Gator? I don't, I mean, I, that's a really good question. I can't really recall it. Like I said, I was expecting to get into private lending and making 10 or 12% a year. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's my mutual funds are making five to 6% a year. Like if I could do 10 or 12, that would be great. And then quickly that, uh, you know, turns into, oh, you could let EMD and, and or give EMD and make 50% on your money in a month. Now, I haven't really done the EMD route, but I've done the, the short-term PML route, which um, can have pretty good returns. So whatever they were, they quickly kind of changed and, and made me, um, I'll say it, greedier. You know, you, you see these big returns and people getting 15, 20% in just a few months and, and that's what you go after. And, and that can be dangerous because um, those big returns come with, you know, riskier investments and second position and things that, that you really uh, need to understand the risk of. Is that something that, is that part of the lessons you learned uh, the first time and the second time in your like real estate forays like you, you said that you had some issues in the beginning and given what you just said now that because you're greedier that greed comes with increased risk but now you have more clarity on that risk because of your past experiences is that true or am i making that up um no, I definitely the, those risks seem seem more more tangible, and I'm certainly um, a lot pickier and and more trigger shy just than I was a year ago in terms of what I want to get involved in and and the sort of collateral and, and protection that I I'm seeking, uh, and and more than anything, it's about who you're partnering with. So the mistake that I made, which I think is a good lesson, I know Pace is talked about this a lot lately, is that just because someone is a connector in our community and brings you a deal does not mean that that deal is flawless and you should just sign up for it blindly. And so that's the biggest mistake I made is, oh, well, this person is is in the community and they're, you know, they, they seem like they know everybody and they've done a lot of these. So whatever opportunity they bring me, I should just go for it. Um, and the first, you know, I mentioned two foreclosures. The first one, uh, certainly looking back on it, that wasn't a deal that made a whole lot of sense in terms of having enough collateral. And it certainly wasn't a deal in terms of the people that I was um, associating, actually lending money to. And, um, you know, that that's about, about doing due diligence on, on your borrowers and talking with people that they've done and really investigating their HUDs and their previous deals and um, kind of demanding a full bio of who they are. Also, so knowing that, can you tell me, because I have never gone down this road and explaining it to me will help educate me, but also others, what are the five things or three things that you now look for before lending? Like, what's the number one thing that you're like, this is my, this is my first gate. Can you right. get through the first gate? Yeah, it's the Sandler submarine. I don't know if you've done any of the sales training in sub two, but like you got to lock that thing down before you can move to the, this is selling yourself on the deal. And now considering what I've been through, it will certainly be who is borrowing the money and what do I know about them? What are they willing to share with me about their experience? So um, having long conversations with them about not just what is the deal that they're proposing, but how they got here, what else they do for a living, what other resources they have. Um, you know, I just talked with someone, I'm getting into a few other groups because I am interested in different strategies and I'm using my entry into those groups to find other lending opportunities. And so I was talking with someone yesterday who needs $8,000 to buy a 
parcel of land, right? That's worth 15 to 20. I'm like, okay, so that's that's good value as a piece of land, but who is this person? Like, are they someone that I um, want to be in partnership with? Because when you're lending money to someone, you need to know that they're going to pick up the phone and that they're going to um, keep you updated uh, every week on what's going on. And I know some connectors and some people will put that right into the JV agreement that says you will provide photos and email update of the deal um, weekly or else you're in breach of the agreement. Um, so first and foremost, I would say, who is the person that you're partnering with? Because we're signing JV agreements. These are joint ventures with another human being. So is this someone that I want to be talking with and depending on for the next three, six, nine months? Not just do they have a deal that's going to pay me a 25% return or whatever. Um, so that that to me is is the cardinal thing because i've had deals that have gone long and gone late and i mean there was one that i did with a guy in sub two and we were in three or four different loans and i was kind of the connector on them but i was also a lender on one and he was phenomenal in terms of just updating us with every twist and i mean that he had went through refi problems like you wouldn't believe and he would just update the group google chat every week um every you know whenever he had a new update and that's like the, that's the kind of thing and you can't really know that someone's going to do that um uh you know just from a conversation so i have like a pml data sheet that i put together that's a big long google sheet that has all these different sections and i put it together so i could track what i needed for the deal but for me it was like if i give you this how fully can you fill this out and that's kind of my litmus test for um you know are they going to be a savvy business person and someone good to work with so now after all your experience you have a pml data sheet which is like your interview process before anybody even gets to the front gate yeah i mean i'll have an initial conversation so i can maybe bring it up on zoom and show it to them but yeah, it's just a sheet that has the property, you know, fields for their experience, HUDs from previous deals, um, you know, who's their contractor and can I get their con? Because a lot of times now I want to talk to the contractor and I want to talk to the realtor that is going to sell the deal um, so that I can get their sense of the neighborhood and everything. And I'm I'm trying not to do as many fix and flips just because um, I'm feeling like we're heading into, and we're already in, but we're heading into a really tender and tedious time in the economy, in our country, in the real estate market, all of those things, which mean that trying to get credit to sell property and trying to get credit to refinance property in August through November is going to be a little hairy. And I don't want to have my money sitting out there waiting for, you know, I'm I'm a little um I'm a little pessimistic on on what the rest of the year is going to look like. Let's put it that way. That's okay. I think it's really important to to have that that view of the future because you know your money is going to be sitting there, and if you're not looking at those macro and microeconomics, then you may be missing something major that could cause your problems down the line. So I think that's really important. I don't think it's yeah. pessimistic. Yeah, I mean, and it just it just <laughs> it shifts where you decide to focus. So I talked about joining different groups. Um, I got really into this idea of flipping mobile homes. I realized I don't really wanna be searching for those deals, but I liked mobile homes because they're uh, affordable housing, they're low purchase point, which means that there's um, a large market to buy them and you can sell them on payments. And I wanna create I want to create seller financing opportunities so I can create, you know, cash flow for the long term. Um, and I don't fear as much lending money to someone who's trying to flip a mobile home because I feel like a lot of times they're just buying them and cleaning them up and listing them. Um, and uh, and it just feels like a safer investment. But talking back, going back to the character of the person, I'm only lending to people who have a personal endorsement from the coach in this program. And so this coach is fantastic and he's very open and available. 
And so if some if I connect with someone on a lending opportunity, I reach out to him and say, hey, do you know this person? Like, you know, have you interacted with them, et cetera? So I use that as my filter for if they're if they're reputable. Amazing. That brings me back to something you talked about in the beginning where you wanted you invested in sub two. Maybe it was a different group you invested in first. I don't know. But then immediately you were like, how do I make my money back? But now I see your strategy is I'm going to invest in a group to go find my leads within that group because that is my entry fee to find more people to do deals with. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. And I just joined another group on land and it's the same sort of thing. You know, everybody needs private capital to, to be able to do their deals. So um, I'm feeling like I want to move away from private lending because I want to get more into, you know, acquisitions and that sort of thing. But I've already kind of I have the battle scars and I kind of know what I'm looking for. And eventually what I want to do is, you know, make these contacts so I can bring other private lenders in and, you know, have them provide the seed money. And I just kind of act as the um, the deal finder. Got it. So let's talk about this you want to you have this like your serotonin right we we talked about this earlier yeah and you just said you want to do acquisitions but you also are like three quarters of the way out the door going down your lending path right is the acquisitions a shiny object for you or is it something that can coexist with your private money lending? And is the acquisitions your serotonin bump that that gets you going where the private money lending is just like, you know, it's not like this anymore. It's like this. Yeah, no, I have different needs. You know, I do a lot of my private lending in my IRA accounts, which I can't utilize any of the proceeds from right but it has a tax benefit because it can grow without being taxed the roth can grow completely tax free the ira stuff can grow tax deferred whereas i also you know i'm trying to create an exit ramp from my 9 to 5 and so i need to create now money and so i'm trying to have strategic partnerships so my acquisition business i partnered with someone locally who has experience with flips just got their license, but doesn't have capital. And so he's kind of going to be the acquisition lead and I'm going to be more on the dispo funding side. Um, and then, so we'll sort of partner together on that. So it is definitely shiny object, but I, I feel like I have different, different needs and different goals that I'm trying to achieve at the same time. Um, and I'm I'm trying to deprogram the private lending a bit so I have capital available to put into acquisitions. Um, but I also know that I have I know so many lenders now that if I had a deal that came up, I could still get into it and you know utilize OPM. Got it. Okay, so that is that really helps clarify. So I don't know if that is shiny object, right? That is growing. There, there's a book, I forget what the book is, but it talks about how to grow a pumpkin, like a, a giant pumpkin that you see at the fair, 300 pounds. And it talks all about, you know, if you plant a pumpkin seed, it's going to grow crazy and you're going to have hundreds of pumpkins, right? Do you know the book I'm talking about? No. I don't remember. I could look it up. I probably should. I use this analogy a few times. But yeah. if you just let the pumpkin patch grow, you'll get a bunch of little little medium-sized pumpkins right yeah great, great for halloween but if you're trying to win the fair right you need to figure out which one you love and chop off all the rest right and let that one pumpkin grow they talk about only having one pumpkin so you can win the fair i i agree with you because i am also the same way i have to limit the number of pumpkins in my pumpkin patch do i need to win the fair biggest pumpkin award. I don't. Do I want to personally have two giant pumpkins or maybe three that I'm really proud of? Yes. So I think for me, it becomes shiny object when I deviate from my two or three pumpkins that I'm growing 
and I start trying to grow other ones. Right. No, I, I, this is, I mean, I think I told you about this before we turned on, like, this is definitely something I'm dealing with because I feel not just my hormone levels, but just this kind of exhaustion of like, what am I doing from moment to moment and where am I putting my focus? And so I do need to pinch some of those runners. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, I'm still trying to find what speaks most to me. Uh, and I love the avatar series and how Pace kind of, you know, has the first thing you do is sort of choose your avatar. And for me, it's connector. Um, but I don't really want to be connecting on private money deals because I've seen how that can be problematic. And so I'm trying to figure out how to take being a connector uh, to accomplish all these myriad goals that I want, the now money and the future money and the passive money and all that. Um, but it's it's hard and it requires a lot of discipline. Do you have a whiteboard that you use to, to draw and write out all your pumpkins? My whiteboard has been sitting in the box that came in, in my office for months. Uh, so, and I have this wall right here and I have this little piece of paper that is the goals that I wrote out at the beginning of the year. And that's kind of all I have. And then like my, you know, my push up tracker that I've only done once. So <laughs> <laughs> that's my whiteboard. But um, maybe after this call, I will take that down and actually put up my whiteboard and, and get, get, get focused with it. These are good questions, by the way. Oh, uh, you can't see it because I have the background thing going on. But I have a, a, a big whiteboard, right? I, it also came in a box and it sits right next to me. It's right here. Wish you could mm -hmm. see it, but they can't. And I think that's been the biggest help for me because I am like, I love, I love that serotonin bump, man. I live for that thing. But I know that that serotonin bump is horrible for me as a person. And also, I just have so many things bounce around in my head. I can just put them on this whiteboard and they can sit there. And eventually I'm like, all right, well, that's out of my head. I don't need that thing anymore. And I just use a magic eraser and I cross it out. But in the top right hand corner, I literally have two columns. One says pumpkin. The other says not pumpkin. So whenever I'm going a little crazy, I have to look up there and be like, OK not pumpkin pumpkin and it, it centers me and it, it calms me down gives me that focus that i need to to really relax and breathe because man it can get horrible out there if you're, if yeah you have focus. I, I love the freedom of working from home you know i work on west coast hours so i don't even really have to be available until 12 30 you know my time um and I have this this beautiful view, but kind of being here at the screens all the time, um, I, I really think that I would be someone who would benefit from getting disciplined in terms of time blocking and just, um, and I know a lot of people do that and rave about it, just kind of, you know, carving out the day, you know, the day, the night before or the week before um, and just saying, all right, these are the three pumpkins, right? This is my lending pumpkin. This is my um acquisitions pumpkin and maybe this is my land pumpkin um and then everything else and just having those those dedicated times um to really really dive into it um and i you know i had a social media filter on my phone and it was like one hour and then i just would like hit <laughs> ignore for today ignore for today but <laughs> it's a great tool i mean i've met so many people and I, you know, decided that I was going to kind of grow my stable of lenders because I wanted to grow that out. And so I did a post in Gator about, you know, the year and the kind of things I've learned and just opening myself up. And you, know, you get all this wave of new potential partners, um, but it's exhausting and setting up Zooms with all these new people. It's really just, you know, that's how you grow your, your network and your business. But it also <clears throat> takes you know, a lot of time. It does. It does. Yeah. So, are you gonna put that whiteboard up today? You said. You said maybe. I, no, that's that's, that's non-committal. 
No, I'm <clears throat> first thing I'm going to do is take down this stupid piece of white paper that's here. Okay. And I think it's going to be good. It's a little high up, but I think it'll fit really well right there. And I'm going to send you a picture and I want you to send me a picture of your board so I can see how you're you're structuring it and we're going to we're going to go from there. There there is no structure. I've got like the outer rim of the board is where like the long term things live. Okay. And then the, the inner section is just chaos. Right now it's clear. I cleared it all out a few days ago because I was like, I'm done with this. <clears throat> it, it's either done or I don't need to do it. So yeah, I'll send it to you. No, I mean my my garage, <laughs> I'm very thankful I have a nice property <clears throat> in Knoxville and we have our main garage and then there's this apartment that I'm in and there's a garage under here and that's my garage and it's just chock full of crap and our main garage is chock full of crap and it has threatened my relationship <laughs> dozens and dozens of times uh, and you know it's just I mean I think it's a DNA thing for me but if I can fix that inner clutter that seems to manifest outwardly I think that I would I would be a lot happier. And as we talked about, I'm thinking about taking on some coaching to just kind of work on my, if I'm going to be a businessman, if I'm going to really commit to that, then I think there's a certain uh, practices of organization and, and task management and focus that I think um, are pretty important. Is your partner really organized? She's not really organized, but she likes <laughs> things clean and calm um let's just say that my disorganization really triggers something fundamentally in inside her and i, I mean I, yeah it's been the source of a lot of a lot of dilemma. and is it is it happened the other way too when when she is like clean and organize this you're like oh i can't it, it i don't want to do it it hurts i like i like it the way it is well, I don't like it the way it is. I just don't have the uh, energy and the sort of commitment to spend, you know, 30, 60 minutes all the time to get it the way it is. But it's certainly been a, it's definitely a, a divergence in our personalities that we we work with a lot. But we, we work I, it all out when we're on, on stage, I guess. I understand that. I, I live in the same boat. My fiance, she is like the most organized and structured person ever me not at all <laughs> and there is a lot of divergence and a lot of it it hurts me when she's like you know this thing is not in the right place you need to move it there i'm like but that's where i put it and that's where i want it she's like that's not where it goes I'm like that's where it goes in my heart leave it be <laughs> but once i let go of that like me grasping on to the non-organized self it does make sense most of the time and it hurts me to tell her that but i do it's like you know life is better because things are less cluttered and it does come over into my business world too because now i time block i don't time block a lot but in my calendar you know the first thing is client to-do list and then inside there i got a google doc that's just a random list of things to do Mm -hmm. And I got a couple of those that are just scattered throughout the day where I have an hour or so of just focus time to do that stuff. And it does really help. It's good. I'll, I'll have to tell someone about that. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you want to know? I don't know, man. It seems like we've kind of reached the end of your book. So <laughs> now it's your job to... Bring us all together, teach us the things that we need to know going into the future, and <clears throat> just really give us, you know how to, you know how this works. Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think that I think that everybody could benefit from from being a connector and, and really using that as a, a driving force. And I know there's a lot of people whose personalities are not built for that, but I think that's that's what allowed me to really grow my business here in this world really quickly was really leaning into that and leaning into our community and then also exploring 
other communities, but there was something nice about having this this little um, you know safe world that I could operate within. Um, so I think that that's that's been the most exciting thing for me is just like growing a a, a family and a, a you know a, a web of partnerships um, pretty you know fairly quickly over the last year. So um, and obviously you know there's going to be some some bad apples and I talked about that mastermind group and there's a few people I had to um, kick out because they just were not keeping the ethos where I wanted to be, which is just one of, um, you know, support and encouragement and, and providing, providing value. So I, I think the I know it's kind of cheesy, but the, the, the go giver mentality is, uh, um, something that I, I really, um, aspire to just because it makes me feel good. And I want to find ways to use real estate to, to be, um, uh you know a force a force for good i know that you focused on some some sober living stuff and i'm trying to figure out um you know obviously we want to get properties at good discounts and uh it kills me when people have gotten my call and they're like oh you're just trying to make money off you know off our property um but i do want to figure out in my own business how i can try and um you know use our skills and our our resources to try and um help everyone Awesome. Awesome. So one last thing. What can I hold you accountable to six months or a year from now? You know, if, if we don't talk for another six months and six months from now, I'm like, hey, Greg, did you do the thing we talked about? What What's that thing? Um, I do find myself and uh, really interested in trying to help other people be successful in investing. I'm not saying I know, you know, everything or whatever, but I, I, I get inspired by trying to um, crack the code for people or at least keep them from certain pitfalls. Um, so if I could help, you know, three people make $25,000 in real estate, either through lending or through buying property or as a partner in something um that that would feel really good to me um you know one of the things that got me driven to to learn how to do this was being an artist and being a creative person that has often been sub you know sentenced to service jobs <laughs> because they were flexible and having a kid who's really into performing I don't want to see him have to be a waiter just because that's what he has to do. And so I really want to teach him how to be an investor so he can uh, have the freedom to do the things that he loves to do and not feel like he's got to take some job that doesn't really speak to him. Um, so yeah, I, I want to try and be a resource for at least three people um, to, to make some money at this. Awesome. So be a resource for at least three people to make maybe $25,000, right? Yeah. All right, so let's let's back into that. What are the KPIs that are going to get you there? Like what how are you going to do that, right? Right. Well, it's hard because I have my own things that I'm trying to achieve in my own business and so as soon as you start opening yourself up to help people, then everyone wants, you know, 20 minutes of your time, but I think um I I think the way I could start is help uh you know, three new people do a private money deal as their first lending uh, experience within the next three months. Cool. So connect three people with lending opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm writing this down because this is good. Awesome. I like that because that that really fits with your ethos and all that we've talked about. And that once again is is driving down that private money road and that connector road for you. So I can see where that is going to be very comfortable and, and pretty easy for you to achieve. I can see yeah, that. And it takes it out of me just thinking about how am I gonna get to where I wanna be as a, you know, as a richer person, you know, which is fine, but like it doesn't, it just seems really um self-involved. And I know that if I help three people find really quality deals, 
I can make a couple thousand dollars on each of those deals or be a JV partner on those deals. And, and that's, you know, I think that's something I'm really grateful to for pace for kind of putting that into my head that there are, you know, there is an avatar where you can be a connector and, um, and still, you know, share in the spoils without going out and calling a bunch of motivated sellers. I wrote down your, your goal so I can document that and we can get back together in six months on that. Love it, dude. Awesome. So how can people get in contact with you? I will put your information into the description of the YouTube video if you'd like, but feel free to let me know. How yeah, no, I, I, I love meeting people um, and I love answering questions and, and being a resource. Um, I'm in Knoxville, so I'm certainly interested in real estate in Eastern Tennessee, um, focusing my land uh, flipping business in North Carolina right next door. I'm also really interested in investing in Asheville. Um, my Instagram is Gregoire Crane, G-R-E-G-O-I-R-E. -E. That was my name in French class, Crane. Nice. Um, <laughs> you know, you can find me on Facebook. You'll you'll put the link up there. Those are really the, the unfortunately, the <laughs> where I'm at the most. Um, and I'm always open for uh, chat or Zoom and answer questions about private money or acting or, um, you know, paddle boarding or whatever. Sweet. Awesome. Well, Thanks. I appreciate it here. I'm going to stop the recording and then uh, maybe you and I can just catch up a little bit on how this went. Cool, bro. Thanks.